What's up guys, we're in Vietnam today testing the Sony A9 Mark III. Yes, I know this camera is complete overkill for travel and vlogging and all of that stuff, but I do think that it's a good opportunity to test it because we will have lots of different shooting scenarios here. And let's be honest, it's a lot more fun to review a camera like that instead of just sitting at the desk and looking at some shots, right? So let's get started, let's get some shots with this camera. So why did I even get this camera? I mean, it's also for me completely overkill. Actually, I wouldn't have to spend that much money. The Fujifilm X-H2S, for example, did everything already that this camera basically does for me. Footage looks good, 4K 120, 24 megapixel plus, 26 megapixel in the case of the X-H2S. Let's be honest, the reason is just gas gear acquisition syndrome. I like playing around with new cameras all the time and I think it's also a good thing because my main job is YouTube and I'm testing those cameras for you guys. And the more cameras I use, the more experience I get with different brands and cameras, so it's obviously better for that. But of course, there are also some reasons that I need to justify a purchase for myself. And it's basically the same as an x stage to so it's a perfect do-it-all hybrid camera in my opinion. A perfect do-it-all hybrid camera for me means 24 megapixels plus, 4K 120 frames per second, 10 bit 42 everything, so that it's perfect to shoot photos, not just for thumbnails, but also photos that I can crop in, etc. And what I've also noticed while I shot Canon, was that I just need smaller cameras. That's also one reason why I switched back to Fujifilm before. It's just the setups are so much smaller. But considering that it's full frame, Sony also does a really good job to keep its camera body small. And that's the reason why I wanted to try this camera out. I get pretty small setups now with that body and the lenses. Also the G Master Mark II 16 to 35, now 550 gram for this lens. It's pretty good actually. And before, Sony just didn't have one of those do it all camera bodies. Like you either had the A7S III or similar cameras that have only 12 megapixels but great video specs or you have something like the a7 IV with 33 megapixels but therefore now 120 frames per second etc I'm not saying that's a bad camera I actually got the a7c mark II as well as a B cam and yeah lenses overall ecosystem definitely play a role as well also the ECM B1M microphone I love this so much also don't forget just because I review a camera or any other youtuber and the camera looks good doesn't mean that your camera is bad if your current camera produces great quality stick to it there is no need to upgrade you can save your money you especially don't need to spend six thousand dollars because honestly i was color grading the footage from the a9 mark 3 and the xs20 side by side and i really had to look at the pixels like dci versus normal 4k here in this camera to notice in some shots which camera i actually use that's how close it is and this is a thousand three hundred dollar camera versus a six thousand dollar camera I also travel quite minimalistic right now with this camera. I only brought two lenses, the 20 to 70 mm f4 and the 16 to 35 mm G Master Mark II. And I will mostly use the 20 to 70 mm because I want to see what I can only do with this lens because I think it's an awesome travel lens. And actually I was sitting here before, I shot some photos and because of that f4 and also having an ND filter on top and I switched to photo mode, I had my shutter speed quite low without noticing it. And I got some really nice shots there with that motion blur effect. And I think that's a good reason to try out new lenses like that. Of course, I knew before that I can get this effect, but I never actually played around with that. And now just by accident, I did that. And regarding SD cards, I use the CFast Express Type A card from Perga right now. It's a card that I can only recommend. I used the B cards already on Fujifilm and the Canon R5. On the Canon R5, I did not have any issues at all with those cards. And on the Fuji, like many people also have with other, can other cards, I had some issues when it comes to playback, but it wasn't really a bad thing because the uh, files were still there, everything was fine. I could just not play back files occasionally. And now, so far, I'm using the CFast Express Type A card from Paragon for about two weeks and I didn't have any issues with it. So if you're looking for affordable C5 Express Type A cards for your Sony camera, definitely check those out. It's just an outlet, none of that is fake. A 
traffic here is completely wide. <laughs> I don't even know how I should cross this crossing. Yes, you just go. It's quite interesting how travel changes over time. Like when I started traveling like eight years ago or so, I always wanted to see the tourist spot, like where everyone goes. But today I don't want to see them at all anymore. I just want to walk around cities like that or other places and get a feeling for it. Like actually have the experience that people that live here get. This is so crazy here. <laughs> People are actually swimming in the middle of the river. Just arrived in Sapa here. The buses are actually quite comfortable as our sleeper buses. Didn't expect that. Not sure if it's the right season for Sapa. It's quite foggy. But we'll see what we can get here. Guys, Sapa is quite nice, but it is a lot more touristy than I expected. If you ever go to Sapa in Vietnam, stay out of the center. Don't book a pre-made tour. Drive here by bus, rent a motorbike here and explore it by yourself. Even Cat Cat Village where we've been before was super touristy. It was just a pure tourist trap. You get some nice views there, yes, but it's not a great experience at all. I would come here again. This place looks awesome but I would do it on my own. absolutely love fog and low light. These shots look so good and it's crazy that you can even get a 5 times 120p slow motion with cameras like that under those circumstances. We still have street lights but it is pretty low light here and it looks fantastic. <laughs> love it so much. Now there were two things that I was worried about before I got the Sony A9 Mark III and that was especially after Gerald Undan's video at first about dynamic range or noise performance, also low light a bit and also about the base ISO of 2000 that's obviously problematic a bit for a video. Now when I watched Gerald Undan's video I thought okay the dynamic range really doesn't look that impressive if you take the noise levels in consideration but that's a good example for lab testing versus real world usage because when I was shooting with this camera I did not have a single shot where I thought that I have too much noise in the shadows or that the dynamic range is not enough of this camera. It actually looks pretty similar to other Sony cameras that I used before. That's the thing, like this additional noise you usually get in some very dark shadows where it's not really important because no one's looking there anyway. And yesterday I also went out and got a lot of low light footage here. I sometimes even shot at ISO 6400. Of course you can see a bit more noise there but it's totally usable that footage and I only used ISO 6400 while I was shooting in 120p for slow motion so I used the shutter speed of 250 there. I got all the normal 24p shots with an aperture of f2.8 at base ISO 2000 and didn't have any issues at all with that so you're perfectly fine with that camera when it comes to low light. And when it comes to the base ISO, of course you need an ND filter. I'm using somewhere between seven and nine stops most of the time. But I think if you use prime lenses with this camera, F1.4, F1.2, etc., then you probably want to get those clip-in case ND filters that you can put in front of the sensor of the camera, then plus a variable ND outside, because otherwise it might be bit much actually or you simply have to step down or raise the shutter speed whatever is an issue yeah but so far with zoom lenses at least I think it's perfectly fine. Doesn't the background look epic? I'm in the city center here I'm not on a volcano or somewhere I'm not even on a hike I'm like five minutes away from my hotel probably even less 
Let's also talk about the standout feature of this camera, which is the global shutter. I must say this is not a decision making feature for me because most of the cameras that I had before already did quite well when it comes to rolling shutter. For example, XH2S reads super fast, A7S III reads very fast as well. A few years ago I shot Panasonic GH5, even the Fujifilm X-T4 and also the X-S20 etc. They, they have rolling shutter. Yeah, you notice that sometimes a bit, but it was never so bad that I actually cared about that so it's not a decision making factor for me to have a global shutter but of course i appreciate it because for example when i filmed out of some windows of cars before so it actually looked better like there were no bended lines at all and that's just a more beautiful image it looks more like a cinema camera in that regards so it's overall nice to have but it's not that you absolutely need it i think if you don't film these specific things, especially helicopters and stuff, then you could probably save a bit of money by going for the A7S 3 And I also think that this feature got a little bit overhyped on YouTube because like many people were saying like that will trickle down in all the cheaper cameras now and stuff like that. It would be cool, but I don't think that that will happen anytime soon because you see this camera costs $6,000. And the reason for that is the sensor, that global shutter. It's hard to produce and it's only for a very specific specific small audience really and that's why I don't see that trickling down in cheaper cameras anytime soon. Maybe what, what I could imagine is that they would come up with a flagship cinema camera, cinema hybrid body like FX line basically where they would combine 12 megapixels plus global shutter plus their dual layer technology to compensate for the smaller light gathering of the pixels with the global shutter sensor because in that case you would essentially keep the video quality on Sony A7S III level but you would also have that global shutter effect. Maybe the image quality would even slightly improve. I don't know how good the um, dual layer technology from Sony is. So that essentially improves the light gathering. So I could imagine that something like that com comes, but this camera would be pretty expensive. I think that would also be somewhere $6,000 plus, maybe even $8,000 or something like that. But I do think that many professional filmmakers would pay that amount of money for such a camera, especially if it should also have an ND filter in front of the sensor, such as the FX6 has this. That's actually a really nice feature. Maybe even I would spend that amount of money then. No, don't need it now. I would probably not do that. But yeah, that, that would definitely be an awesome camera. But in the cheaper cameras, I, I don't see that happen. But enough talk for now. We're going on a hike soon in that fog. I think we won't get many of the views, but it will be epic. Enjoy the footage. Now we hiked about five kilometers and we're in a local village here. It's quite interesting actually to see how the locals live off season, like when there's no rice growing here. Because obviously you see how rough that actually is and how much work they put into those rice fields throughout the year just so that we can see that when we travel here during high season and of course you eat the rice. And it's beautiful, it's so epic with all the fog in the mountains here. This is actually worth going and totally worth the hike. I think it's probably four kilometers more or so. That's good, I still have to lose some kilos. Traffic jam doesn't only happen in the big cities. Well, I think he doesn't want to be in the vlog. But bro, you can't change that. We're in here now. Oh, I made it past him, he didn't kill me. You stay here, you stay here. <laughs> Go 
up the stairs now. I think it's 604 stairs or so. It'll be a walk. They told me yesterday that the best time should be August, like there you have sun and the rice fields are also up. So it should all look very nice. I'm really curious how this place looks here then, because then we we'll probably have cloud ocean, but you're not surrounded by the clouds like we are right now. Would be a good opportunity for time lapses, drone shots and stuff. Let's come back to the A9 Mark III and talk about what I think of it as a Fujifilm user. Fujifilm camera that comes closest to it clearly is the X-H2S. Similar megapixel amount, focal 120p, 10-bit, and it doesn't have a global shutter, but the readout of the sensor is so fast that it's really rare that you recognize any rolling shutter in this camera. So I actually think for less than half the price, you get probably 90, 95% of what you get with the A9 Mark III. With the extra edge to S, yes, it's not full frame, but who cares? Like use some prime lenses and you get that full frame look. However, the selling feature of Fujifilm is clearly the full film simulations, but Sony also offers a great feature which can kind of compensate for that, at least for video, and that is LUT support. I'm using the Phantom LUTs here with S-Log3 to see on the display how it will look later. And I actually liked it a lot. Like those LUTs, they look super good. I also have a little tip for you that you can use to avoid lower ISO performance. It's getting a bit loud here. Now, I do prefer Fujifilm's film simulations, especially because it's also available in photo mode and also because you can customize it a bit more on the go. You don't have to define it previously and load a lot in your camera. But I do think for video, considering that I shoot in lock all the time, it's actually better to have that LUT support because I don't change the look of my footage, like the view assist function anyway, while I shoot lock. So for video, I'm actually perfectly fine with that. That's why LUT support is actually quite nice. It's not only in the A9 Mark III, all other Sony cameras have that as well, which is great. But I do wish that Sony would also put that into their photos and do JPEGs and HGIF files because then you would also have kind of a substitute for film simulations in Sony cameras. Now oh, here it's a bit better, no wind. Um, anyway, what you can do... Hi, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> Having a nice trip? <laughs> Where are you from? Meche. Meche? Meche. Meche is here in Vietnam? Or, ah, okay. You have a nice country. Ciao, no. Messi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Anyway, I have a little tip for you when it comes to avoiding noise in low light situations and also sometimes when it's cloudy or so. So it's very easy to underexpose then. What you can do with those phantom LUTs, they, they come in two versions. You have the normal version at first. I have to hold it a bit down because of the wind. And you have the legacy version, which is, I think, about a stop darker than the normal LUTs. So when you load those legacy LUTs into the A9 Mark III, you automatically overexpose all the time because your image would otherwise look too dark. And that's how you protect your shadows. I would not use that on sunny days or so, because then it's easy to clip your highlights. And it's always better to have a bit of noise in the shadows than having clipped highlights. Because it's very easy to denoise footage, but clipped highlights are not rescuable. There's nothing you can do, really. So that's why I only use it in low light situations or maybe when it's cloudy and you tend to underexpose your shots a bit then those LUTs can really help. That's why you should also have both versions of those LUTs in your camera. And these phantom LUTs are also generally LUTs that I can recommend a lot for color grading S-Log3 footage from Sony cameras because they do a very good job but I personally use the DaVinci Resolve color management. It just works great and always gives me a good starting point but if you want to work with LUTs and Final Cut for example then you should definitely get those phantom LUTs for your initial transfer from S-Log3 to Rack 709. Anyway, let's continue the trip. Yeah, I made it to the top. Now I directly have to go down because the cable car is going. <laughs> it's a problem when people don't speak your language. You ask them if that's the way to the cable car, they say yes, and you go the wrong way. So I got back down again. It's a good opportunity to talk about the body of this camera. 
camera. I really think that this body is a bit underrated. Like most reviews that I saw just said, okay, feels a bit nicer than all the Sony bodies. But I think it's actually a big upgrade. Like the grip is not just deeper, but also a bit thicker. What makes it feel a bit more like Canon, like on the older grips, on the A7S III, etc. I always felt like it had a pretty sharp angle on the front and it always pressed a bit in my fingers, but that now feels a lot better. And also that screen that you, that you already had on the A7R5. This is such a big improvement. Like even as a videographer, I'm constantly just flipping the screen a little bit to the back to look at it while I'm looking down. And for example, in Hanoi, when I did some street videography, <laughs> if that exists, it, it was so helpful because I, I like to film people while they do something without knowing that someone films, films them because then they act completely natural. The moment you talk to a person and you want them to do something for you, for the camera, they act differently. It doesn't look natural anymore. And that's why like having that option to just have the camera at the bottom and quickly flip out the screen, press the button and just keep it rolling. That is actually huge for like the way how I shoot my videos or at least my travel videos. And also here, like sometimes it's just convenient to use the screen like that. So in my opinion, this is the best Sony body that has ever existed. And I do think that they are very close to Canon now. Probably I, I would actually rate it better because the bodies are smaller at the same time while they now feel very good in your hands and you have this awesome screen. So I'm back in the sleeper bus on the way to Hanoi. Let's talk about the downsides of this camera. Of course, it's not perfect. There aren't that many actually, it's a pretty good camera. And the first one, of course, what I mentioned already, the missing LUT support for images, but it's not a big issue overall. A bigger issue I find for the price, I think it's a bit software limited. Like from the hardware side, I'm pretty sure that it's capable of recording 6K open gate, for example, and many cheaper cameras such as the X-H2S, the X-S20 and Panasonic cameras, etc. offer that. This camera does not, but it costs a lot more. I think that's a software limitation and Sony should add that via firmware upgrade in the future. So it is quite useful sometimes, even if it's not a deal breaker for me. There are also a few other software functions like Sony added now finally shutter one of 48 for example which is good but why don't add shutter 240 and 120 for example there's still only 250 and 125 available that would also be good and finally like all cameras from sony i think the way how the custom modes work is a bit bad because you cannot choose which settings should actually be saved and which shouldn't. So for example, I have my C1 set to 24 frames per second, C2 to 60 and C3 to 120. And now all the time, all the settings change to the settings that I initially set up. But for example, my white balance, it changes all the time. And I don't want it to change all the time when I'm switching custom modes. So it would be great if there would be a feature that saves that so that I can set it depending on the day or the shooting location and it just stays as it is even when I switch my custom modes. It would be a great feature and Fujifilm, for example, also doesn't do it perfect, but I found it a little bit better because I can essentially use those modes there like the normal manual mode. But that's all for now. It's overall a very good camera. It's actually yeah, my favorite so far, but well, it comes at the price. So yeah, let's come to a conclusion when we're in Hanoi. I filmed a skater here doing his tricks and I filmed in 4K 120 frames per second with autofocus set to white and face tracking on. It didn't lose his eye at all, I was always on it. And 120p plus global shutter etc. That is so good for skateboarding shots. I, I wish I had a camera like that in my teenage years. Sorry, in that age you probably don't have the money for that. But still, for like sports videographers, awesome camera. So let's wrap this up and I want to start that by saying that for me personally the A9 Mark III is the first camera that I would call a perfect camera. Of course it mustn't be the case for you, maybe you need more megapixels, maybe you need something else that this camera does not offer. But considering that it has 24 megapixels for my time lapses and also a bit of photography, it has 4K120 without a crop, everything in 10-bit 42, even 4K60 oversampled without a crop, LUT support. 
so many custom buttons, a really nice camera, body, great accessories with the ECM B1M microphone, etc. I don't know how this camera can get better. Maybe, yeah, they could improve the signal to noise ratio a little bit more with a dual layer technology or stuff like that. There's nothing that this camera must improve on. There are a few things that could improve on via firmware upgrade, but there's nothing that must be better. Like there are no deal breakers or anything. And of course, it's not the best camera in every aspect, signal to noise ratio again, for example but it's also not bad in any of those aspects. It's actually quite good. It's just not as good as, for example, an A7S III when it comes to noise in the shadows, but it's still pretty good. And under real life performance, I don't notice a big difference. So I'm perfectly fine with that. What I must also say is that this camera is $6,000 and you don't have to spend $6,000 to get great video quality. As mentioned before, I color graded the XS20 and the A9 Mark III side by side, and I could not tell the difference. I really had to look for which camera I used for which clip occasionally. And that says a lot. You don't have to spend $6,000 to get great video quality. It's more like to have this whole package where everything that I just mentioned is inside one camera body and it does everything very well, but it's not a must have at all. And for my Fujifilm followers, you don't need to worry. There will still be a lot of Fujifilm content on this channel. I'm not giving up on Fujifilm. I'm going dual system now because I just think it's good to have one system that just does everything pretty much perfect like Sony does and one system which is just more fun to use, Fujifilm where you have just a nicer experience overall with those film simulations and smaller bodies, etc. I was thinking of getting the X100 Mark VI soon because I think it's a really nice camera. Just not having to worry about lenses, etc. Just throw it into your bag and having a good B camera with you. So I hope you enjoyed this video, even if you're not actually interested in the A9 Mark III. And by the way, when if you're looking for a new camera bag, I recently reviewed seven bags that I used over the past few years. So check this video out here in the corner and I hope to see you there. Bye.